Before we look at what's interesting and, and unexpected about derivatives, I want to um, talk about a few more functions so that we're ready to apply the derivative for those and think a little bit more about the geometry of uh, some very important functions on the complex plane. So one of the most important ones is complex conjugation. Take z to z bar, and the definition is x plus i y goes to x minus i y, where x or and y are real. So that just flips x plus i y, say, up here to x minus i y down here. So it just flips it across the axis, reflection across the x axis. Okay. So the the picture for that is very simple. You know, if we look at the where the grid lines would go. It really doesn't do anything interesting to the grid lines. You can't even notice it. It's just the labeling of the grid lines that's different. That say 3 plus 2i, then it goes down here to 3 minus 2i. Okay. So that seems like a very innocuous function, but we're going to discover that it's not nearly so innocuous as it looks, in particular because it's not defined in terms of algebra of complex numbers. It takes the complex number apart into its real and imaginary parts and then kind of manipulates them separately and puts it back together. That is sometimes what we might want to consider a, a bad thing, okay? It's really taking advantage of the two-dimensionality, in other words. So that's going to be interesting when we look at derivatives. Um, another one, uh, I showed you one, uh, z squared with those funky parabolas with the computer picture. What about 1 over z? That's a really super important function, okay? Um, to understand the picture, we're going to real imaginary parts. It's 1 over x plus i y. And you're taught uh, in, uh, in high school, the, the very little bit of stuff we're taught about complex numbers usually, is that the way to understand that is to rationalize or realify, really, the denominator by multiplying top and bottom by x minus i, y. Oh, guess what? That's z bar. I'm going to write this in terms of z's and z bars in a minute. Um, but that's x minus i, y. Why is that so useful? It's because the magic of the difference of squares plus the i's is really cool here. You get x squared, and then minus i squared y squared, or in other words, plus y squared. This is really good because denominators are dangerous, but the only place this could possibly go wrong is when x squared and y squared, or x and y, are both 0, only at the origin. Oh, that makes sense, because the only thing that should mess me up when I take 1 over something is when it, it really is the complex number equal to 0, with x and y both equal to 0. So if we want it really explicit, it's x over x squared plus y squared plus minus i times y over x squared plus y squared. This might look, start to look familiar if you are coming from a vector calculus um, background, and especially if you've watched my videos, uh, especially about the vortex vector field. And that's not an accident. This is this incredibly tight link between this and uh, the vortex vector field. Okay, so um, if you just express it in terms of z's, it's actually very elegant. 1 over z, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply it top and bottom by z bar, which is exactly what I did here. And then what I've got here is simply, you can shorthand that as a very nice little equality, that z times z bar is the magnitude of z squared. And of course, the magnitude of a complex number is just how far it is from the origin, and that's the square root of x squared plus y squared. So if that's x and that's y, so this becomes x plus i y, then magnitude of z is this radius. Okay. So uh, what does that do as a mapping? We've got a, an algebra for it. Okay. Well, one last thing is that the magnitude of 1 over z is not hard to uh, calculate that. It's just um, 1 over the magnitude of z. Okay, And there's been a conjugation involved as well, this conjugation. So if we look at the graph, the way the graphing works, here's z goes to z bar. Oh, sorry, 1 over z. Okay. What that's doing is it's taking a point. Let's, let's look at points on the unit circle first. So that's 1i minus 1 minus i and everything else the same distance from the origin. Uh, if I've got a point there, the magnitude of 1 over z, this had magnitude equal to 1. And so this also has magnitude equal to 1. So the unit circle goes to itself, but the point doesn't go to itself. It doesn't go to here. It gets flipped. Okay. So when, in other words, when magnitude of z equals 1, 1 over z is just z bar from what we had before. Okay. 
But then something that's smaller, like at magnitude 1 half, that's going to get flipped out to magnitude 2. If magn as magnitude goes to 0, these guys are going to go way out to here, as makes sense. When z goes to 0, 1 over z should go to infinity, okay? And it happens to go in the conjugate direction. And as I go out like this, these points, the 1 over z's, are going to have small magnitudes like this, okay? So all circles, like a big circle goes to a small circle, a small circle goes to a big circle, um, and then there's a flip. Okay, so if you know about circle inversion, it's really inversion in the unit circle. So this point would go to here, this point would go to here, and then and conjugacy. Okay, so that's that's nice to know. Now, what this has brought up uh, along the way here is the polar form of a complex number. It's going to be really important for the next function we do, okay? Um, and that is that when I have x plus i y, I'm not going to give a whole lecture on this because this is something you should definitely know if you're watching this video. Here's magnitude of z, here's z itself, and then it's often interesting to look at that angle theta just to do it in polar coordinates. So we call this r or magnitude z. We'll do that interchangeably, okay? Um, and so if I have z equals x plus i y, it's often interesting to look at that as r times the quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay, and there's a, an abbreviation sometimes people use, cis, cis theta, okay, and this is a very, very useful way to express complex numbers, and I want to remind you that there's an even better way than, than, than these two ways to talk about it, which is that Euler's famous formula says that that can be expressed as e to the i theta, okay? So that's a good, if that's something that you're not super familiar with, that's a good one to look up, that this is just e to the i theta. That's going to be super, super useful for us, okay? In particular, it's going to start us uh, understanding a little bit about the exponential function in the complex plane. Uh, not only what e does to a real number or a pure imaginary number like this, but what, what, it, what does it do to an arbitrary complex number, okay? So um, let's do that. For us, the most, most, most important thing is really, I'm going to rewrite it, e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. Why is that so important? It's because the ge it encodes incredibly important geometry, namely the unit circle. Okay, That as theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, e to the i theta goes around here. So this is e to the i 0, this is e to the i pi over 2, e to the i pi is minus 1, famously e to the i 3 pi over 2, and then, interestingly enough, e to the 2 pi i is also the same as e to the i 0. That's going to be of a little bit disturbing for us in a minute, okay, but that's still cool, okay. So um, what would happen if I took e to x plus i y, a totally general complex number, so e to the z, in other words, okay. Well, should that make sense? Well, absolutely. All we have to believe is that the usual rules for exponents hold, and you can prove that from whatever definition you want to use of the exponential function. There's a few. Power series is usually the, the one people use, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. So just uh, rules of exponents. e to the x, totally ordinary real number. e to the i y, of course, cosine y plus i sine y. Okay, so this is interesting. Real part turned into magnitude information imaginary part turned into angle information, okay? Because if we think of that as r e to the i theta, then we're saying that the, the magnitude of the output is just the ordinary exponential of the real part of the input. And the theta, it's also called arg of e to the z here, okay? The theta is just the argument of that complex number, it's just the terminology, and that's going to be the imaginary part, straight up, no modification at all, okay? So what does that mean in terms of the mapping? It means, well, we know that the real axis, starting from 0 going out, that just maps to the real axis starting from 1 going out and much faster, okay? The rest of the real axis maps to just this little bit of the positive real axis. That's just the usual exponential function, okay? Now, the Euler's formula tells us that the imaginary axis, if I start from here and go up, then the output actually traces around the unit circle over and over and over again. So the imaginary axis wraps around, and in fact, if it went minus, it would just wrap around the other way, 
okay? So this line wraps around here. Well, what about other lines? Well, like 1 plus i y, I let y vary, that's going to be e to the 1 plus i y is e times e to the i y. This goes the unit circle over and over again, and it's just at radius e, okay? So that's going to be a bigger circle. This guy out here is going to be even a bigger circle. This guy over here, like e to the minus 1 plus i y, that's going to be a circle in here. And what about going like this, okay? If I look at like um, x plus i, actually let's say i pi, oh, let's say i pi over 2, okay? So let's say that's, I started i pi over 2, and then I add different values of x, okay? Well, e to the i pi over 2 is just i, and then the e to the x's go like this, okay? So these guys turn out to be give us this guy. So it's polar, it's basically polar coordinates. You have to remember that the way we're counting the radius is exponential, but it's, it's closely related to the Cartesian to polar transformation. Okay, so straight lines go to these guys. Notice that again, orthogonal, perpendicular, still goes to orthogonal. Interesting. Although right at the, right at the origin, uh, things are getting a little weird because everything gets scrunched, but that's okay. We know that zero is pretty weird because e, you can never get zero as an output of e, ever, even with complex numbers. Okay, one last function, um, f of z equals ln z. If we're going to discuss exponentials, we probably should discuss the, the natural log, okay? I probably shouldn't have just erased that picture, huh? Um, because really, I just want to look at that picture backwards, okay? So, what's ln of, well, do I want to do x plus i y here? That's not going to work real well. Instead, I'm going to choose to express my number. I'm going to go ahead and use ordinary polar. Now here, I'm using ordinary polar where I'm going to make the grids equally spaced, not exponentially spaced. Okay, And I want to figure out, for example, something at you know, r equals 2, theta equals pi over 4. Where should that go to under ln? Well, it's basically just taking the opposite of what I've got. These circles are probably going to go to straight lines, and these radial guys are probably going to go to the perpendicular straight lines, okay? Well, let's look at the algebra. Still true that the log of a product is the sum of the logs, and so in terms of real part, I'm just saying, ooh, just look at the magnitude of my input. That'll tell me the real part of my uh, output complex number. And then ln of e, that just cancels, and I get e to the i theta, or just, e th just i theta. Okay, so, um, it's exactly backwards from what we did before. They are real part of input turned into e to the x for the for the magnitude. Now the magnitude just gets logged and it tells me the real part of my output. Okay. The big thing I want to tell uh, talk about here. So, well, let's see. So this this it really does give this picture. These guys turn into the circles here. Varying theta gives me varying i. So those give me these guys. Some fixed radius here gives me a fixed real part and a variable uh, imaginary part. And then these guys will turn into these guys. Okay, really is the opposite of the picture we had. Just reverse the arrow. But here's the tricky thing, though. That function, the exponential function, wasn't really, really invertible because this is a little tricky. Okay, if I look at the unit circle, let me just unbizify this thing. Let me just erase for a second. Okay, if I look at just the unit circle, okay, and I look at ln1, well, that's zero. Okay, now I look at ln of i. Well, I just express that in polar form, and then I'm done because I just I just cancel them out. That's i pi over two. Okay, similarly, ln of this guy gives me i pi. Ln of this guy gives me i three pi over two. I'm just taking i theta because the ln of the unit radius is just going to be zero. But here's the here's the kicker. Ln of one, huh? It looks like it should be two pi i. They don't agree, okay? And this is something we discover as soon as you start talking about polar coordinates or even just the unit circle in trig. We know that there's this, there's this ambiguity. Do I think of this direction on the unit circle as 0 or 2 pi or 4 pi or 6 pi? The only thing different is that when I look at logs, I'm just putting an i in there, okay? So ln has to be either discontinuous at this, at some juncture, like here, like a jump, jump, suddenly I'm approaching 2 pi and then I suddenly go back to the default value 0, or uh, multi-valued, 
I somehow make sense of a function that goes from 0 to 2 pi to 4 pi to 6 pi and keeps going. The graph of that would be like a spiral staircase going up, 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 um, which you might have seen. It's called the helicoid, okay? Or um, one, way, one way to fix it is just don't define it everywhere. Just refuse to like, let's say we just don't define it there, or maybe we don't define it here, and we never try to cross between minus i pi and plus i pi, okay? One of these three things, and it depends on what your context is, has to be done to fix this guy, okay? This is going to come up in a very, very interesting way, that ln is a cool and interesting function with one, you can either say bad feature or super interesting feature, that I can't really define it in a, a particularly nice way and go around. And so again, if you've uh, thought about like the vortex vector field or Green's theorem or things like that, we're getting a hint. Hey, looping around the origin gives us something weird. And in fact, it gives us something weird called 2 pi. Okay, we'll get back to the issue I alluded to in part one about weird derivatives uh, in the next video.